everyone. This is Wendy Alexander. Welcome to the My Wim Life Show, where I interview entrepreneurs and take their wisdom, humor, inspiration, and motivation and share it so that you can have the life that you dream of. So today's guest, uh, I absolutely adore her. We met through, I think we met through Carly, actually, through uh, fitness and health and things like that. But she is also a realtor extraordinaire, um, and everything about her just lights me up. We've had several different conversations, uh, and I am super, super, super excited to have her here. So tell us a little bit about you. Well, I'm a Boise, Idaho native. I'm a second generation realtor. I was born and raised here locally. Um, I'm married. I have two bio kids, and four um, bonus kids. Love it. Um, I run a, a pretty successful real estate business. I love real estate. I think it's, I think ownership is the lifeline of financial stability in a lot of ways for families. And I'm very passionate about creating that financial security and not to mention the safety of home. I think yeah. that drives me in my business. It drives me to help people create that wealth when you look at the statistics you see that you know almost 90 percent of people's wealth comes in the form of equity in their home and so without helping people get to a place where they have a brick and mortar home it, it could really deplete their chances of being financially secure so i'm really passionate about that and the safety it brings to a family to have a place to call their own that they're not worried about being evicted from or catapulted out of um, as you said, we met during the health industry. I've ended up on a huge health kick in the last few years. Um, I was, you know, terminally ill for a great portion of my life and, um, what had a great intervention, medical intervention. And I've been lucky enough to not have cancer for the last four years. So I'm pretty passionate about health and trying to get my body back to healthy. Um, and I think that that is a lifetime thing. You know, I did a lot of damage to it. So I find myself very involved in that. And, you know, I'm an advocate for peaceful co-parenting. And I spend a lot of time helping people navigate that water of how to be peaceful within co-parenting. Doesn't always work. Doesn't always function in my own life. But I am a huge proponent for it. And um, I'm a proponent for happiness. Do a lot of yeah. coaching on, on happiness and how to stay happy. That was awesome. It's so funny because the more that you talk and the more conversations we have, the more I think we're alike. Like there's so many things in there that we do, you know, not may not we may not do all of the same things, but we battled a lot of those same right. things. I have been blessed not to have cancer as part of my story, but I, you know, I had a terminally ill child and and so I I know what that battle is like from from a parent's perspective and I know I know what co-parenting is um cuz we had three on his side and three on my side coming together uh all in their teenage years like that was terrible. <laughs> we have four high schoolers at home right now. Yeah, yeah. It's always such an adventure, right? <laughs> it is. <laughs> that is so awesome. So I know you kind of mentioned this, but you came into real estate totally by family lines. Your parents were real estate agents, correct? Yes, both of my parents were real estate agents. My dad was a broker and um, he had about 26 agents all the way through the late 80s, early 90s. So I, I literally grew up in a brokerage. You know, yeah. I, spent, I spent my childhood coloring at an open house and back then going to mall call. They used to go down to the mall and all these realtors would like shout out their listings before MLS. Wow. <laughs> and, and, you know, the day I got licensed, our, our like, Oh, what do you call it? Our purchase and sale was only two pages on vellum paper with three sections. Yes. That didn't last long after I got, I think it was on its way out when I came in, but I still have some pretty interesting mer memories from that. And there was no buyer's agent. Everyone yeah. represented the seller. Crazy. 
Crazy. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's just so interesting that you have such a unique view of the entire process. Mine, you know, I feel like I've got a pretty broad knowledge, but mine only started in, two th you know, the early 2000s. So mine is very limited compared to what, what you've experienced for sure. And I'm sure that attributes a lot to how you handle your customers and, and what you look for and what's important to you in those relationships as well. Oh, I think it definitely does. I think I learned really early on that I did, you know, I wasn't making some mistakes that other people made. And the fact that like, I, I know pretty quickly whether or not a client is going to be a good fit for me or whether or not I'm going to be able to represent them well, or whether I'm going to dread picking up the phone every time they call. Yeah. And I think I started very early uh, referring out people that didn't vibe with me and realizing that you know, if I took a client that wasn't a good fit, that we were going to struggle and they probably yeah. weren't going to like me in the law. Even if I finished the job for them, they probably weren't going to like me in the long haul. And so, yeah, I think it definitely shaped some things that shaped negotiations. You know, I grew up in a time where there were verbal negotiations. Um, most negotiations were verbal between realtor and realtor. And then you would call or then you'd go back to the office and write it up. Yeah. So I'm very much a call first and what does it take kind of yeah. realtor, which I think catches other, the nowadays realtor is like hiding behind the keyboard. You get a pop up and it's like, oh, I have an offer, but you, you didn't call me. <laughs> right. I know. And, I'm, very, I'm very much the same way. I don't understand. I always call the agent before I ever write the offer. What is the seller looking for? What do they need? What's important to them? So that I can understand both sides of that spectrum. And then I never send an offer without calling, but I get them all the time. I know. It's really interesting. And the whole, and, and as a, as a business person, I find it really an interesting thing because in that phone call, you're, you're normally going to find out whether or not you have a chance of getting in contract or if it's kind of a waste of time. You know, you sure. get into that phone call and you're like, oh, you know, my clients need a nine day close and oh, your client's looking for a six months rent back. Right. Very different. And it's not all disclosed until you get on the phone and, you know, it saves me time. Like it's good for my client, but at the end of the day, it's really good for my business. Absolutely. And I think both, yes and, both are important. Right. Yeah. So tell me about your struggle with cancer and how you have worked your way back into health. You know, I was diagnosed really early on. I had a six-week-old baby at home and um, I had soft tissue sarcoma, which is just tumors of smooth muscle. Um, so they were just kind of everywhere. Um, and I started having seizures around year six and was suffering with a multitude of seizures, not grand mal, um, but debilitating all the same. Sure, um, sure. I didn't, I didn't have a grand mal seizure until 2014. I had one in 2014 and another one when I came home from a brain radiation in 2015. Uh, I was put on hospice three times during wow. Um, from 2007 to 2015 and each time I got granted into a trial and kind of yanked um, out of the grasp of death I guess and granted more time to experience this amazing journey and this last time um, was the same kind of deal I unexpectedly found myself on the phone with a doctor that I'd gone to my very first trial with he said I think I think you need to travel I think that what you need is out there and so I did I traveled to Peru and um, had t-cell therapy done in Peru while I was still very early on and came back and have been you know in remission for what is 2016 so for almost four, almost five years wow yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That is so awesome. I love, I love that there are opportunities for hope for people because I think it can be very debilitating. It can be very um, almost uh, paralyzing uh, out of fear and the unknown. And so anyone who has come out the other side is always someone that I want to 
um, definitely show off and make sure that people know that it does happen. It's not, it's not all doom and gloom. It doesn't take us all. Right. And it, and it is, and a lot of it is, you know, I think for me personally, having a mental illness that is considered terminal, just hearing that word causes like the jail cells and it becomes really hard to even look out beyond it. It can be very boxing to, yes. to and, and very lonely to watch everyone disconnect from you while they grieve you and try to process um, how to deal with your dying. Yeah. And I figured out fairly early on that I didn't want it to be a focus in my life. And so I did. I called everybody and said, I don't really want anybody to go to the doctor's office with me because I want, A, I want to ask the questions I want to ask. And I didn't want to be afraid of what the answer was for the person sitting next to me. Yeah. And, and I really struggled with having that space of I wanted to protect the human with me. And, yeah. I, and I wouldn't ask the question, you know, or I wouldn't say no to a treatment. I knew I wouldn't, you know. And there were a lot of treatments that I ended up saying no to because I got to ask the questions I needed to ask. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even that request was hard. My family had a really hard time that I said, you can't come to the radiation. You can't come to the surgery room. You can't, I don't right. want you, I don't want you to see that side of this. I want you to see the living side for as long as I can. Sure. And so I really did box that. And I don't know if it was for me, it was, it was life-saving. I think because no one ever looked at me like I was dying. Because nobody right. ever heard that from a doctor, right? right. So nobody had to sit there and hear that but me until you know until the very end. Um, in 2015, when we stopped doing when radiation stopped working, you know I think it was evident that I wasn't doing well. And yeah. So I I think it was readable on me for the first time in seven years. Yeah. You know as the seizures became worse, but not having to invite other people into that space with my doctor or into a room where I was going to have an operation, um, I think left me some room to have a healthy life still where people sure. didn't always say, well, how are you? Right. <laughs> well, please don't ask me that. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, you know, I, I this is a loaded question. Else. It is. And I'm sure that you experienced it. You lost a daughter. And um, there's nothing worse than when everybody's got to know you're yeah. not okay. Right. <laughs> so don't ask. If you know somebody's not okay, I just suggest not asking. Right. <laughs> or you may get the anger end of that stick because sometimes we've heard it so many times, we just are about to lose it. And you may be the target of that. <laughs> and I am so sorry. <laughs> I know, I know you're just, and, and, and I think that everybody just thinks they're being kind and I even have to buy my lip. Like, you know, I'll call somebody and be like, how are, mm, what do you need? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me bite my own lip here. Yes, exactly. Um, so speaking of a healthy lifestyle, I know after you came back Peru is when you really started to look at what health what you could do for yourself what what has that journey been like you know it's really interesting you know i came i came home you know i came home and i when i got back i i just had like no muscle like i was you know i'd been at the brink and i'd been on a lot of medications you know when i got home i was on like 16 meds yeah and i'd really gone on a mission to get off the meds and that was the first mission was just to like kind of rid my body of that. And then it became really obvious that like I had some muscle dystrophy that needed addressed and the physical motion of it felt like it was moving the emotional motion of it. Yeah. You know, it was, you know, when you spend a lot of time dying, it's almost heartbreaking to live a little bit because all yeah. of a sudden all the things that you're like, you don't think you're going to have to handle kids growing up, your relationship not being so romantic. Like there's a million things that when you're dying, you're like, woo, money, woo. <laughs> and so there's like this realization moment. And I think that I used health as a way to take control. It was like, what, what can I do right now 
right. that makes me feel very in control. And that became my body yeah. very quickly. That's fascinating. I love that. I, I, you know, I definitely understand uh, how that works. I've used exercise in the exact same way to be like, everything else in my life seems chaos. Let's just, I know how to move this body. <laughs> totally. Yeah. You know? So I definitely, definitely get that. So through all of this, obviously you've experienced cancer. You have, you know, now you've got this split family that uh, you're trying to raise, you know, kids that aren't necessarily yours and doing the co-parenting thing. How do you stay organized and moving forward in your business through all of this? You know, that's a really hard question. And I think it comes in seasons for me, mm -hmm. you know, I, as, as the world, as, you know, as my, as things get loud, you know, as family members get loud or, you know, whatever, as, as life unveils, I think as an entrepreneur, it's really hard to stay on track. Yeah. Um, I think that that is just kind of the plight of not having a nine to five. Yeah. And, and so I think it, it really links kind of into that routine of things of, of remembering that I need to get up and work out. And then I need to block out my time. And, right. lu and luckily for me, I've been in this business long enough that my phone rings, right? Yeah. I don't know what would have happened had my life been as, you know, back in the day, I did a ton of marketing to receive client. And, you know, I used to block out time. I door knocked and did all those things. You know, that yeah. my dad sent me out on foot all the time. And um, now at least, my business almost is a requires of me, right? Like I yeah. can try to ignore it, but my phone's going to ring and, and I have such a passion for home ownership and to move those homeowners into investors within the business that, you know, it, it just calls to my heart. And so as soon as the phone rings, as soon as something's in motion or even worse, like I'm driving down the street and I see something that's going to work for someone. I'm like, that's it. Oh, right. I get that. <laughs> um, I think it's, um, I think it's really powerful that, that some people can use a calendar and I would love to say that I am a calendar junkie, but I think I'm a cal calendar failure. Like my calendars are never synced. I'm always a little confused. And <laughs> I mean, you know, I think I called like three times. I was like, is today the day? Oh no, it's not. Never mind. Today the day? No, no, it's not. Never mind. Oh, I thought I booked. So I, I can't say that I am the most organized. However, yeah. my house is spotlessly clean and I know where all of my files are. So I think there once it gets go. in motion, I, I do have a habit of, of keeping things very clean and, yeah. and tidy. And, it's very uh, pattern oriented. I'm very much the same way. I'm very pattern oriented. I like the system and the process and I'm, I can totally handle, you know, the, the vine that runs off on its tangent, but uh, I definitely like the process. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm very patterned, and, and and it's almost like event hit. So as soon as something happens, like it's like triggered by an event, and then I'm like, oh, and it kind of scales out, you yeah, know, very very quickly, and then as soon as it's over, which is what I love about real estate, is like there's an event that starts it, and there's this huge success. Yeah kind of at the end. And I think I, I'm, I'm a time period based person. Like I'm a kind of a sprinter in the, in the, in the field of business. Like I like to sprint for people. I'm not sure that I would have been a good account manager. I think it's, I think it's great. I think that you, you know, I think there are people who are very task oriented and then there are people that are very calendar driven. I think they're very different, different approaches. Neither one is good or bad. That's the benefit of being able to interview all different kinds of entrepreneurs because we all have different ways of doing things, but it all leads to success. There is right. no right or wrong answer. Right. Uh, absolutely. Thank so what? Goodness. Right. <laughs> um, so what in your lot in your personal life or your business life, what things have you put into place that are your absolute non-negotiables? Every day sleep. I've learned that I don't function well. 
I, I didn't used to sleep. I was kind of an anti-sleeper for a really long time. I didn't sleep well. I thought I was missing out on time. And so after I recovered, sleep became a, a huge motion, especially in my health journey. And just realizing that I'm a better person with six hours of sleep, just yeah. like a uniquely better person. <laughs> um, Jason Stephenson talks me to sleep every night. If you haven't listened to Jason Stephenson's like good night, um, guided meditations. I, I am a huge guided meditationer. Um, so I end my night with Wayne Dyer and then Jason Stephenson, non-negotiable. Um, I don't do caffeine before noon. Nice. So tea only. <laughs> uh, That's good. My gallon of water is pretty non-negotiable. Yeah. And 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 then it's a daily thing. I I am a person that can be anxiety driven, yeah. and so I've learned that my focus, you know, needs to be daily, if not hourly, and sometimes minute by minute. Yeah. Just of that constant reminder to reset and re-engage and be present in my day. Yeah. Um, and I do three tasks a day. So since I don't calendar well, I'm definitely a wake up and I jot down my three and I connect and I connect with someone every day. Yeah. Someone, someone that I know needs it or whatever I send. I'm a huge mail person. I like to mail things. I like to do letters and notes and so I try to get something in the mail every day. Nice. I love that. I love that. Um, so tell everyone how we can reach you. You can find me on the Facebooks. Um, Kayla Collins. I'm at discoverboiseid.com. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it might be getting a revamp this week. So if it's down, don't judge me. Uh, <laughs> I just hired somebody new to do some management on it. And I'm on Instagram as Bravada's Adventures. And nice. there's always a phone call. You can you can put my number out there. It's everywhere anyway. Us realtors have have no We have no privacy. No, no shame in the game. <laughs> no. <laughs> At all. I love it. I love it. All right. And my very last question, how do you give back? I give back in two ways. Uh, a uh, become a home buyer program where I give at least half, if not all, of my commission to families in need um, that just can't quite get there. And I negotiate out my commissions. Uh, there's an application available if you know a family that's on that cusp. Maybe they're approved, but they just don't quite get into where they need to be. Yeah. Um, it's a passion project. I've been doing it for, oh, 14, almost 14 years. Oh my gosh. And I do anywhere from eight to 20 a year. And uh, totally a passion project, I love it. Um, I do happiness coaching for teens on pro bono, where, so if you have a kid that's just not quite connected, I love to come over and spend an afternoon and help them understand happiness. Yeah. And how to cultivate it in their lives and in their spirit and get after it and, you know, I'm practicing grace and I find that to probably be the best give back is that I'm a little bit more graceful. Yes, for sure. For sure. And I love that, you know, I mean, you're surrounded by teens every day, so you're talking their language. And, and so being able to give back in that way is pretty unique opportunity. I think so. Yeah. I love thank it. you so thank much for having me. Oh, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you squeezing in the time during your travels to be with me. And I'm sure everyone else will love it too. Oh, I adore you. And thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to the My Wim Life show today. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a moment of the goodness.